Hello and welcome to this Lo-Fi Future DIY tutorial video. In this installment I'll be showing you how to circuit bend and modify the PlayStation 2 so it creates some really wild glitch visuals and even some crazy audio samples too. I'm going to show you how to completely disassemble the PS2, give it a deep clean because of the age of these consoles it is almost guaranteed to be grotty on the inside. And I'll also be showing you how to make a nice drill template, mark it out all by hand, drill holes in the PlayStation 2, and we'll be doing a soft mod in the form of the Freemic Boot memory card, which allows us to load backups of our PS2 titles off of an internal SSD or a traditional hard drive using one of these network adapters here. One of the big advantages of using the Freemic boot system on a PlayStation 2 we're going to circuit bend is it means we can actually remove the optical drive entirely and this gives us a ton of real estate to mount all of our controls and switches and stuff. Now this process has been covered extensively on the net so I'll provide some links in the description on how to set up the Freemic boot system yourself and get your backups running off of a HDD or SSD. There are a lot, and I mean a lot, of different revisions of the PS2. This tutorial will sort of serve as a general guide. If you're experienced in circuit bending, you'll most likely be able to figure out just from this video. But for more detailed information on different revisions, head to lofifeature.com. And without further ado, we will start by disassembling our PlayStation 2. So the first step is to pry up these little rubber feet and blanking caps on the bottom of the console. There are eight of them and you just pry them up with a flathead screwdriver and they pop out really easily. Once that's done, use a Phillips head screwdriver to remove the eight screws, taking note of which size screw goes where. Now we've removed those eight screws and set them aside safely, we can flip the console over and carefully lift off the top half of the shell, making sure not to pull on this little flat flex cable that's leading to the power and reset switch. The power and reset buttons just lift out, it shouldn't take a lot of force and once you've removed them, the top half of the shell is completely free. We'll just set that aside for now and we'll get to deep cleaning that in just a little bit. Now we will move on to further disassembly of the console, starting with the memory card and controller ports. Just remove these two screws and the assembly should lift out but is still connected via this flat flex. We need to flip up the little clip on this zero insertion force socket and you should be able to remove that cable with literally no force, it'll just slide out nice and gentle. Now the controller port is unscrewed, we can actually lift out the whole internal assembly chassis of the PS2 from the bottom half of the case. So we'll go ahead and do that. Now we can take the bottom half of the case, set that aside again for deep cleaning. As you can see, these things get gross on the inside. Now we can remove the optical drive. Now this isn't held in with any screws. Instead, it's held in with just a couple of metal clips. The front clip, if you just pry it up a little bit, you can pop the drive out. Then we just have a couple of cables to remove from the assembly. On this particular revision of the PS2, the CMOS battery is actually held on a separate PCB that is attached to the side of this optical drive. We can just slide that out and make sure to relocate it on the inside of the console later so we can save set and stuff like that. And as you can see, we've got a few cables to unplug from the optical drive here. There's a few two pin cables that run from the front of the drive into the main board, a flat flex on the side there, and then two larger flat flexes that connect via ZIF socket. And with those cables unplugged, we have the optical drive completely free of the main assembly. Now we can move on to removing the power supply board. So this is done by removing these four screws and then lifting the power supply board out vertically. It's connected to the main board by a little four pin connector. And with that, we can just remove the hard drive cage by lifting it off nice and easy. We also need to remove this little piece of plastic. Make sure this goes back in the right place when we reassemble the console. Now we will remove the sub assembly with the power switch, AC input and cooling fan on. It's just one screw on the corner here and then remember to unplug the tiny little two pin power cable leading to the fan. Now's a good time to remove the flat flex cable running to the power and reset switch. It's quite hard to get to up until this point so now take the opportunity to flip that ZIF socket up and carefully remove that. And with all that disassembly done, my workspace is absolutely filthy, so now's a good time to take a little break and clean everything down. 
And now we're on to the final stages of disassembly. So we will move on to using a smaller Phillips head screwdriver here and go ahead and remove all of these small screws that hold the heatsink assembly onto this metal chassis here. Go ahead and gently lift up the heatsink assembly and now the motherboard is completely free and can be gently cleaned with some compressed air. Now after all of that disassembly we have finally reached our destination. See all of these resistors in between the Emotion Engine and the Graphics Synthesizer chip? They are present on both the front and back of the PCB and they are data lines to what are essentially the CPU and the GPU of the PS2. When we go ahead and short circuit or connect these resistors together, what we're actually doing is corrupting the messages these two chips are trying to send to each other. Now because the data these two chips are trying to communicate is actually complex physics and 3D graphical information, when we go ahead and short circuit these resistors it produces some absolutely wild effects on the screen. This can range from polygon stretching and warping to texture and shader glitches and even these crazy video feedback loops you'll find sometimes. It varies from game to game quite a lot. Some games do tend to crash with certain glitches and you'll have to restart the console but some, like Vice City for instance, can take so much glitching and then you can just flip all the switches to off and the game's pretty much back to normal again. And now it is finally time to start soldering in the circuit bends. As you can see, the resistors we will be soldering to are pretty damn small, but it won't be too hard with the right tools. Two things that are going to make this process easier is a good quality enamel coated wire and plenty of good quality flux. The enamel wire isn't really suitable to solder directly from the PCB to something like a switch or a potentiometer. So I like to use a small bit of perf board that I can super glue somewhere onto the main board near the circuit bend points. I can then solder the fragile enamel wire to this perf board and then go from the perf board to a thicker standard like ribbon cable or something like that. In this case, I am using a Dremel to rough up a section of the PCB where I'm going to glue my perf board to. Now, I'm making sure I'm doing this just over the ground plane so I'm not damaging any traces or anything like that. With those bits of perf board glued in place, it is now time to start the process of soldering from the resistors to the perf board with the enamel wire. Take your time with this process, don't rush, and of course use plenty of flux on each connection. If you accidentally flood any of the resistors with solder and cause a short, then definitely don't use a solder sucker, but instead use desoldering braid. It's far too easy to heat one of these resistors up and suck the whole thing into the solder sucker and it's gone, so definitely don't do that. So go ahead and do this for all of the circuit bend points you plan to solder to, and of course head over to lofifeature.com for detailed pinout guides and diagrams of what resistors you should and shouldn't solder to here. As well as the visual circuit bends, I'll also be doing some audio circuit bends to this console, and we will do so by soldering directly onto the pins of this IC here. Now this IC is just a little bit of audio RAM, which stores the digital audio data before it gets converted to an analog signal at the output. We can short circuit pins of this IC to get some really cool crunchy audio effects, but even better than that, we can short circuit pins from this IC to the Emotion Engine and Graphics Synthesizer lines and get some really cool cross-modulated video and audio circuit bends. And now we are done soldering in the enamel wires. As you can see, it's looking pretty nice. We're making sure to avoid going right across that mountain hole there, because if we were to do so, we would just crush those little wires together and cause some issues. Now that the hard part's done, this is where I like to go ahead and give all of the case a really good deep clean, make sure everything is spotless and ready for its transformation. Now we have a beautifully clean PlayStation 2 enclosure, it is time to go ahead and mark out the holes for drilling. So I like to lay some masking tape down on the surface and use a ruler to find the center point of the console. I'll then use my favorite tool, the veneer calipers, to go ahead and confirm that that is definitely center. And then I'll go ahead and start marking out my lines. I'll be installing a bunch of toggle switches on this console, as well as four 3.5mm jack inputs to accept gate or CV signals from modular synth. You can also use potentiometers to control the, your circuit bends. They do provide a little bit of variance between on and off, so you can actually change the level or intensity of them. Although the range isn't great, still really cool and a good option to have. 
Now that all of our holes are marked out and we are ready to drill, I will start with a 1.5 millimeter drill bit. Starting small to keep things really accurate and I'll go ahead and pilot hole all of the holes that I'm gonna make. Now all of the pilot holes are drilled out, I will actually go and remove the masking tape at this point. I find this helps that when we start boring out the holes to larger diameters, it stops that excess residue getting caught in the holes and sometimes you'll have it hanging around every time you wipe the console, it just smears residue over it. So I like to remove it early on. I'll then use a couple of different sizes of drill bits, slowly getting bigger until we reach the desired diameter, in this case, six millimeters. Once all of the holes are drilled out to the correct diameter, I'll use this countersink bit to quickly go around and deburr all of the holes, leaving the edge of the plastic with a really nice finish. Dust off all of the plastic shavings and then it's time for a cleanup. Go ahead and install all of your hardware. In this case, I've got 25 toggle switches, five 3.5 millimeter jacks and a RCA video out to install. I personally like to install a 3.5 millimeter stereo out and a RCA video out that are hardwired to the PlayStation 2's original AV multi out connector. Now this just emits the need for that old AV multi out connector and allows you to use your own high quality cables. And there we go, that's all of the hardware mounted and now it's time to wire it all up. I'll be wiring up this PS2 in a bend bus configuration. Now that is a set of switches that all connect to one common point. So for example, I have 25 switches here, all leading to 25 different bend points. I can take any one of these bend points and connect it to any other bend point in that set. This allows us to patch in all sorts of different effects by selecting different combinations of these switches. Once we have soldered in the common bus that runs between all of the switches, it's time to prepare some cable that will connect these switches to the little bits of perf board we glued to the main board earlier. Now, as you can see here, I'm using some standard ribbon cable, and this actually turned out to be somewhat of a mistake. Because all of the connections we're soldering to on the main board are actually high-speed data connections, they don't really play with EMF or outside interference very well at all. And once I had soldered up all of my connections and started up the PS2 for the first time, there was constant glitch and constant interference. It didn't turn out to be a short on the main board, it didn't turn out to be a short in my switches or anything like that, it actually just turned out to be all of the ribbon cable wires running in parallel, causing interference between each other. What I had to do was actually split each wire of the ribbon cable apart, just give a little bit of air space, and that was enough to deter the interference. So with that lesson learned, I would recommend you use normal hookup wire instead of ribbon cable to connect from the switches to the mainboard. Now with the wires soldered to the switches, it's time to solder the other end into the mainboard. So once we've trimmed and tinned all of the ends of those wires, go ahead and carefully wire them in one by one to that little section of earthboard. Let's not forget the audio circuit bends we added in as well. Now this is where I realize I don't have enough clearance between the metal chassis and my ribbon cable. So I'm gonna go ahead and just use a pair of pliers to bend a section of this metal off and provide a nice bit of clearance. Before we think about closing the console up, it's time to solder in my audio and video connectors to the AV multi out. You can also find the pinout for this on lofifuture.com as well. There is one feature of this particular PS2 that I won't be covering in this video, and that is the gate inputs for external control voltages. I will, however, cover that in a future video on how to control circuit bends with external modular synths. All we have left to do now is reassemble it. Of course, we've added all these extra wires, so take this process slow, make sure that you don't pinch any wires during reassembly, and really make sure that you aren't obstructing the heatsink assembly from making proper contact with any of the ICs. I'll fast forward through the rest of the reassembly here, and then we will fire up and see what it can do. And that's about it for this video. I'll leave you with some footage of the PS2 running some games. I do hope you find this information useful and have fun modifying your own PS2 console. And as always, thanks for watching. Hello, Sonny. Tommy! Tommy! It's been too long. I know, I know. You're just overwhelmed with emotion. Fifteen years. Seems like only yesterday. I guess that's a perspective thing. Hey. 
Doing time for the family is no piece of cake, but the family looks after its own, okay? I see him walking down the streets of the neighborhoods. It'll be bad for business. Two. Yeah. 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 Two.